bless you for who you are. We adore you because you love us and you're always ready to bring us closer to you. We have come because you have said we should and you have brought us here. We pray that you visit us now, bless us and give us peace and the strength to send your word abroad. In the name of Jesus, we have prayed. Please be seated. Sister Golda, Jess, please come up. This morning, we're going to talk about the Apostle Paul and see what we can learn from him. With my class, to do that is Sister Golda's class. And so we shall present something and then allow you time to contribute and to ask questions. God bless you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Right, so as um, Auntie Doc has said, um, the Bible character study, um, Bible character we are studying this morning is Paul. And as you can see on the screen, uh, we have a picture of him. I hope uh, that's what he looks like, actually. <laughs> right. So um, this is a man we often refer to as um, Paul Ambantum, or it was Snake Dikampo, and um, we'll get to know later why he's called that. Um, we have split the presentation into two. And per the outline that we have, we have the meaning of the name, um, the background, achievements, challenges, and lessons for the contemporary person. So I'll take the first three slides, which is the meaning of the name, the background, the achievements, and Antidocus will do the strengths, challenges, and lessons for the contemporary person. Right, so as I said, um, we're talking about this great man who is described as an influential um, figure in the early development of Christianity. And um, with the meaning of his name, we can't talk about Paul without um, looking at the meaning of Saul because that was a name that was given to him at birth. And so for the meaning of Saul, it's, um, it's ask, inspire, borrow, and beg. And then the name Paul, which comes from the Roman family, means small or humble. Now the background, um, Paul was born um, a Jew from the tribe of um, Benjamin. And in fact, he's often called um, Saul of Tarsus um, in the town called Cilicia. And I understand now it's South Turkey. And um, he was a Roman citizen by Jewish dispersion. He grew up um, in the home of Gamaliel. Gamaliel is um, known to be a leading authority in Jewish and religious establishment. And there, under his feet, under Gamaliel's feet, he learned the law of Moses thoroughly to the extent that um, during his early life, he was a Pharisee and he kept the law of Moses to the letter. And I guess that's why he was bent on persecuting people who were professing Jesus as the Messiah. So, um, one day, he was on his way to Damascus to do what he knows how to do best, to persecute the Christians um, in other places. He was moving from one synagogue to the other. And um, from the research that we did, we learned that he had a problem with people professing Jesus as the Messiah. If I didn't think that a Messiah should be treated the way he was treated. And so, on this road to Damascus, Jesus, the resurrected Christ, appeared to him. He struck him dead. Sorry, he struck him. And um, he went blind. For three days, he was blind. And um, found himself in um, the home of Ananias, who um, restored his eyesight. And then he began his ministry, and he didn't look back. And... Um, for his achievements, we have um, quite a number. He's known to have taught the gospel of Christ in, um, in the first century. He founded many churches, some of which are in Galatia, in Corinth, in Thessalonica, and many others. Um, he's generally considered one of the most important figures of the apostolic age. 
And he's also known to have authored a number, but about 14 of the books of the New Testament, some of which were mentioned there. It looks like the text is not legible enough. But um, a few of them are the Romans, First and Second Corinthians, Galatians, Colossians, and many others. Right, so I'll end it here, and Auntie Dorcas will continue with the strengths. Thank you. Thank you, Golda. So we continue with the strengths of the apostle. The apostle Paul was persistent. He even says in his letters, Something like pray without ceasing. And then he would always pray and praise God. When you look at Romans 1, 9 to 12, you'll find an example of that. He's courageous. He speaks boldly. And that is what every Christian is expected to do. I'll be mixing some of the implications for us as we go and then end with specific implications also. You remember when he had to speak before the elders, he went bold. He knew what he was talking about, and that was Paul. He's humble. He will say, my elders, priests, and so on. He was no longer that proud Pharisee who was uh, persecuting the Christians. He was uncompromising. He would call a spade a spade. And that was Paul. He was a peacemaker in spite of everything. He told the Philippians in Philippians 2, 1 and 2, be ye like-minded. He wanted them to live in peace. He rejoiced with others. You find an example in 2 Corinthians 7, 6, and 7. Because of time, I will give some highlights of the text, which we could refer to later. Later on, we will leave the presentation with the control room so that it can be circulated. Paul was also passionate. He did his mission as though his very life depended on it. And yes, his life depended on it. In the face of persecution, he wasn't relenting. That was Paul. He was content with his lot. He had a stomachache that disturbed him so much. And then when he found himself being persecuted and all that, he, he wouldn't complain, but rather... He said he prayed about that pain and the Lord told him, my grace is sufficient unto you. Philippians 4, 11 and 13. He abounded in prayer and praise. In most of his letters, he would begin by thanking the Lord for the people and then praising them also and telling them, I pray for you always. Some other strengths are that he's not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. He says, we are fools for Christ's sake. That is how the early Christians were considered. They were considered fools. They were the meanest of all people. And Paul had accepted, though he was a Pharisee and had learned the law and had occupied important places in society, Paul was ready to be mean also. And in 1 Corinthians 4.10, we find this, and also 1 Corinthians 4.13, and yeah. Then he had great love for Christ. 2 Corinthians, uh, Romans 8, 35, 36, 37. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? He talks about death, persecution, or whatever. Because of his love for Christ, he wasn't willing to stop at anything. Paul was strong in faith. In 2 Corinthians 5, 6, 7, and 8, 1 Timothy 1, 12, 1 Corinthians 9, 26, and 27, we find him saying things that confirm his faith. He says he's not ashamed to own his Lord or to defend his cause like the hymn we sing. 
Then will he own my worthless name before his father's throne, and in the new Jerusalem appoint my soul a place. Those were Paul's words, and those translated the kind of faith he had in God. He jealously guarded his salvation. Paul wouldn't toy with his salvation. He never said that I'm saved and that is it. He worked at it. And so he told Timothy that he would keep on fighting and urge him also to do the same. At a point when he realized he had done enough, then he talked about, I have fought the good fight. So Paul guarded his salvation. We find this person that we talk so much about having challenges. Some we might call weaknesses. But because Paul used all these challenges as a springboard to further uh, his faith and to do the work better, we better see them as challenges. Paul uses harsh words at times. He called non-Christians outsiders. He called them the world. And then he called Christians the church. He called non-Christians also those who do not understand. It's like in our local parlance when you would use some other word, derogatory word for somebody just to describe the person. I wouldn't want to mention any of those words, but you know them. Again, he was all sold out for Christ and expected people to get it straight as he had. Because he was sold out and accepted the faith as it was and wasn't willing to compromise or anything. When people were not doing what he was teaching them, Paul thought they were fools. He said, foolish Galatians. Can any of us call a brother or sister foolish? No. But that was Paul. Again, Paul was very ambitious. He desired to preach where Christ has not been named in Romans 15, 20, 21 and Romans 15, 24. He says to complete the Mediterranean world by going to Spain. The word, the word had not reached Spain, and Paul wanted to get there in spite of all the suffering he was going through. Sometimes he was confusing also. And one of the things he said that have, has come to hit the church is that women should not preach in church. Women should be silent, and some churches accept this. And I had a boss who didn't understand why I should be director for an organization in West Africa because I was a woman. He didn't understand why I should preach. I was then a local preacher. He said, he referred me to the, the, the text and said, women should be quiet. And I looked at him and I had pity on him. But that was because Paul said it. But again, the same Paul talks about women who were helping him in his missions and praised them. And he found their services useful and talked about them. So sometimes his utterances were kind of confusing to others, and they are even today. Now let's see a few lessons we can learn from Paul. We learn that no one is beyond the saving grace of God. Any person who is a member of the Al-Qaeda can be saved, and the Lord can use him. God is no respecter of persons. You can be the worst in society. The Lord can use you. You can be a prostitute. You can be a thief, an armed robber. The Lord will use you. So we have to allow ourselves to be used by God. Anyone can be a powerful witness for Jesus Acts 20, 19, 28, 31, and even in family networks. There Paul talks about Christians, you know, uh, converts, 
whose spouses were uh, worshipped idols. And instead of telling them, either bring your husband or your wife or you are out, as we used to do. Paul does not do that. He tells them, for instance, he will tell the wife, stay in, don't leave your husband, but help him to get to know Christ. And by that doing, he helped them to share the gospel within the family. And so sooner than later, the husbands and the children all became Christians. These are some of the things we have to do. If your child is not coming along with you to church or not interested, find time. Even if it's five minutes a day, talk to that child. Make devotions a part of your life. And the Lord himself will do the rest. Then we should continue to fight and not be sluggish to attain perfection. That is what Paul did. We shouldn't say that we are saved. And so that is it. And so when the gospel message is being preached, you think it's for the other person. It is so for you. We need to grow and we need to reach perfection, as John Wesley told us. So we must strive to reach perfection. No matter how others consider us for reason of our faith, we should not lose heart. 1 Corinthians 4.10, Philippians 4.11 and 13. Remember, they were being called fools, and they were the meanest in society. That shouldn't let you lose your faith. Because you are a Christian, they will give you names. They, will, they can call you a sophomore when you are not even thinking about being a local preacher. They have seen something different in you, and they have no other way to express it. Express it. They can use derogatory words, but that is where the Lord is confirming you. So we shouldn't think about some of the ways in which people treat us because of our faith. Pray and praise without season. It is communication with God. As you sing, as you praise the Lord, as you pray, you are communing with God. And that is where we draw our strength. Wherever Christ sends us, we should go, no matter the challenges. 1 Corinthians 4, 12 and 13, you find an example there. Always project Christ and not yourself. Always project Christ and not yourself. That thing is easy to do. Sometimes you are talking about something the Lord has done in your life or has used you to do. If you do not take care, you will praise yourself and draw attention to yourself, neglecting God. But God does not share his praise with anybody. You have done nothing. He only used you. And when we have done these things, the Bible tells us to say, we have only done what is expected of us. But that is what we see happening these days. The so-called prophets and angels and whatnots, they profess themselves. And we should learn today that that is wrong. If you are professing yourself, go ahead and profess, but I will follow Christ. Then we have to be humble and courteous always and to all people. Humility. Paul was humble. Else, how could he have sent the message to the poor, the, the idol worshippers and so on? But we get carried away. And we don't want to talk to certain people in the church because they are not our class. In the areas in which we live, we don't want to we don't want to talk to them because they come nowhere near us. How else can you share your faith with them if they are not your class? You look down upon them. Paul is saying to us this morning, we should stop doing that. We must evangelize the world. Paul said, and Jesus Christ confirmed it to Ananias also, that he was a chosen vessel for Christ. And his mission was to send the word to the world. 
And that's exactly what he did. In spite of every obstacle he faced, what are we supposed to do as Christians? Is that not our mission as well? From Jerusalem, we should go to Samaria and to the ends of the world. And Jesus told us also, and that's why the Methodist church and the other churches are today. What are you doing? You have to send the word. This is the time for evangelism. We are concentrating on evangelism as a theme this year as a, as the Methodist church. What have you done? Are you taking the word, the word? Have you finished your home? Your colleagues? You know, those, those you come into contact with. We are being called to do that today. You could read Thessalonians 1, 6, Acts 9, 15, Philippians 1, 12, and 25. But how are we supposed to do this evangelism? Paul did a lot. One person. He did a lot. Are we able to do that? Is the world drawing us back so much that we forget the reason why we are Christians? Or we forget the reason why we are here? Sending God's word to others is more important than anything in this world. I find it so. And I opened my lips and told God that I will do your work even if I have to lose my job. And I was talking about a good sum of money month. But I felt I needed to say that to the Lord. I couldn't contain the pressure. What are you doing? Are you waiting for the Lord to do something drastic in your life before you realize you are supposed to preach the word? You might not survive it. You might not wake up tomorrow. You might be maimed along the way. You might get dumb. What are you waiting for? Aren't you afraid that you are not speaking the word? That you are not sharing it with anybody? One day, some weaknesses of yours might be written. Maybe passion might be something that will be credited to me as a weakness. What about you? You have to do it. Pray about it. Let the Lord give you strength to do it. Apart from your home and also speaking the word and, and, and evangelizing. How are we supposed to do it? We have to go. Paul went to every place and went to Spain. What are you doing? When the bus is going to any of the posts, are you willing to go when your, your, your organization is going? Are you willing? If you are unable to go, your substance can do it. Paul says we should do that. Let your substance evangelize also. So, when you talk about physically going, Philippians, Philippians 1, 5, 1, 8, he rejoices that others preach along, even if with impure motives. People preach Christ, whether they are preaching for money or not. Paul is happy because the word is going. So preach it also. Even if you fumble, it's okay. Somebody would have heard the word. Use your substance. Romans 15, 24. Philippians 1, 5 and 4, 15. Use your lives, your moral conduct as Christians, the work of your hands. 1 Thessalonians 1, 9. Paul praises the Thessalonians because their lives were preaching Christ. And others who saw them were happy and had joined the band, even without hearing the word. So, you can do the same. If you are a trader, if you are at the office, 
They're different from the others. They're different. That is all you will be evangelizing. We have talked about spreading the, God, the word within families. And you find it in 1 Corinthians 7, 12 and 16. Brothers and sisters, reputation is what folks think about you. But character is what God knows about you. Reputation is what people think about you. But your character is what God knows about you. So begin to form your character today. So that the Lord will be happy of the mission he has given you. Paul says, imitate me in Romans. And in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, he says, Be ye followers of me, as I also am of Christ. If you want to be a follower of Paul, as he is of Christ. If you want to imitate Paul, we have presented Paul to you. What's your decision now? The Lord is watching and waiting. Form your character today. Amen. Please, we have some time for contributions and questions. You are welcome. Yes. Well done, sisters. I know that Paul, we were told that is a very zealous Jew. Paul, Saul of Tarsus was a very zealous Jew who would not budge for any Jewish law to be broken. Now, uh, what is, when, when exactly did the turnaround come? Keep? Because he had, was it because of what happened on the road to Damascus? Or the three days that he spent with Ananias? When exactly did he have? Thank you very much. Also for my senior and my boss is here to help. But the little I will say is that Paul was a son of a Pharisee. The Jews who had run away as a result of persecution in Jerusalem. And so he grew up to become a Pharisee also. We said he was learning at, at, at the feet of Gamaliel. So he was a Pharisee. And the Pharisees did not mince words when it came to the law. They would do exactly what the law says. And that is why Jesus called them whitewashed tombs. It is not good to heal anybody on a Sabbath. Let the person die. That was the Pharisee. But when Jesus touched him, he put his Holy Spirit in him and he studied what Christ had taught from the early Christians and the disciples and he realized what he was doing was wrong. But he being zealous did not leave him. He was zealous even with preaching Christ. And that is why he had to bear all the suffering. And yet he continued. That is the little I would want to say. If it sounds convincing. Other than that, when my boss comes, the turnaround, it came when Jesus touched him. That is all I can say. When Jesus touches you, you stop all the nonsense in quotes. You stop you put yourself away and imbibe Christ. And so you will stop persecuting the others. But the zealousness, Paul took it into Christianity. Thank you. Thank you, madam. In your presentation, you made us to know that Paul was a man of great faith. Even at a point in time when he was suffering from stomach absurdity, he prayed and it went away. And 
in some of the episodes, we saw that even his handkerchief was healing people. He offered an advice to Timothy in 1 Timothy 5.23. And I read, No longer drink only water, but use a little wine for the sake of your stomach and your frequent ailment. Why didn't Paul do the same? I'll tell you, Paul's pain did not go away. He prayed about it. And what he says the Lord told him was, my grace is sufficient unto you. So in spite of the pain, go ahead and do the work. We all suffer. I shouldn't be standing here, but I am because some grace covers me. And I believe that God's grace is sufficient. If I should shut up, I believe I will die in a minute. And so I'm afraid not to do the Lord's work. And as for that advice to Timothy, it's become a controversy among Christians and the rest of the world. Please do not go and take alcohol because Paul told Timothy to do so. We get alcohol from some of the foods we eat. I wouldn't be able to tell what kind of food they were eating those days. If you eat maize, eh, bangku, akle, and the like, they have a certain concentration of that. Yeast, eh, yeast develops in various foods, and we add to bread and all that. Let me rest my case. Do not go and tempt alcohol, else alcohol will tempt you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I've heard somebody whispering that Mr. Mukui's question has not been answered. I will dare an answer. Uh, at the episode of uh, Damascus, Jesus told Paul to go to uh, Ananias and he will be told what to do. So when he went there, he might have been told something which made him to leave that place to Arabia. So from there, he started his ministry. So I think that is uh, where the turnaround started. Thank you. Okay. So let us rise up. Um, if you read Acts chapter 9 carefully, in verse 9, actually in verse 7, verse 6, 7, and 8, when the Lord encountered Paul, verse 9 says that he went blind. And when he went blind, the Lord directed that Ananias meet him. In that meeting, the Lord had told Ananias in verse 15 that Saul, the one you are going to, is my chosen vessel. So the Lord at that point in time had already touched that young man and chosen him for a purpose. Why did God make him go blind? Before everybody comes to know the Lord, we live in spiritual darkness. Paul, as a Pharisee, thought of himself that he knew it. Remember the Lord Jesus one time when he had an encounter with Pharisees, told them that if you had told yourself that you are blind, you would have seen. But now that you say you see, you will not see at all. Now Paul, the Lord metaphorically was explaining or revealing to us what should take place in everybody's life. You move from the state of blindness and you are brought into the light of God. So Paul physically got blind and then the Lord through his servant opened his eyes to let him know that something has actually taken place with you. Now, because the Lord had chosen him, he was inwardly moved by God's spirit. The Bible says that he was baptized. We are not told the kind of baptism, but we know that every Christian is entitled to two kinds of baptism. Baptism by water and baptism by the Holy Ghost. Now, the Bible says that immediately after the baptism, Paul went into the synagogues and he began preaching. Now their conversation had changed. 
he had moved from Jesus not being the son of God of the Messiah and he was arguing with the people telling them that Jesus Christ is the Messiah two things are taking place inwardly the Lord had moved him physically the Lord had touched him so you could see that something had happened to him his mind his focus had undergone some kind of transformation is the more reason why that we don't see much evangelism in church because it's an act of the spirit moved by the holy ghost and for every christian to desire and want to do it must be touched by the holy ghost a lot of us because we are born into church through sunday school we've gone through it at now many have not really 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 had that tete-a-tete with god though we know a lot about god but that personal tete-a-tete is not there if you have ever met uh, a juju man convert the following day he starts preaching if really have met a true muslim convert the following day he starts preaching when people really meet god something happens to them and the next moment they start so strongly through that encounter something happened physically and spiritually that's why he started the business of proclaiming thank you also good any more uh, questions yeah, i'm at the back here please thank you sister for the expose we know for sure paul did a lot transforming europe or asia at that time all the churches were established by paul and many people were transformed they came to christ it was through paul that the church was established in rome the seed of catholicism and we have also originated from britain after our, it was carved from rome but the issue now is for all that paul did transforming the lives of people bringing people to the realization of christ the center of our faith first century in the 21st century all the churches that paul established in europe have turned muslim turkey where paul comes from is now a muslim country what is the reason was it that paul's uh foundation of the church was not deep enough or what has happened between first century and 21st century that is my question what is amiss thank you pa i wish you would answer this question yourself <laughs> pa your knowledge is beyond mine can you help us then please thank you please give the mic to pa checha he will help us answer there are so many reasons but he will give us the best in fact between the first century and the 21st centuries we've had what we call persecutions there have been various persecutions and along the line there was a vacuum once in life there is a vacuum you allow satan or evil forces to take over so in the course of the 17th 18th century during the slave trade and other trades you know people's faith in god vanished and they took to what has actually not been proclaimed by the bible and they did their own thing again i believe that in the course of the industrial revolution people thought that industrial revolution or science was more than uh, faith in christ and they withered away currently in america in britain in many parts of europe christianity has so become low so low that there is no church in these areas i remember in my formation at trinity college one of our lecturers old testament he told us look one day not more than 10 20 years Ghana will evangelize America and Britain and certainly yes these days we have many of our ministers go to Britain Germany Europe and America in fulfillment of the prophecy by professor Dawes so as soon as your faith becomes slow 
and you think that science has replaced Christianity, then you begin to worship in your home instead of fellowship in the church. You begin to propound your own theories instead of sharing fellowship in the church. And there are many things we do as humans instead of in the spirit. So 21st century, Ghana Methodist population 800,000. The issue is, are we really 800,000 after 60 years in existence? When some other lesser uh, Latter-day Saint churches are more than a million, is it that our faith is being increased or reduced? So what becomes of the church in 20, 30 years time? Shall we become like Turkey and the church is there? There is the need for in fact, deep-rooted faith in Christ and a lot of evangelism in the other areas and knowing ourselves and serving Christ as Paul did in the early days. Otherwise, we cannot count our children coming to uh, our faith. They'll be joining other faiths. But we believe that Christ does his own things and changes the world at the time he thinks best. Thank you for the short answer. Thank you very much, Pa. <laughs> For an in-depth answer, we trust the Lord to turn things around. Christians have done it before, and they will do it again. Hallelujah. A last question. Thank you. Go ahead. Hello. Mine is not really a question. It's a submission and contribution to what has been shared. Thank you. In relation to the alcohol incident, it wasn't really about promoting alcohol. It was a, you know, Paul was a learned man. It was a practical advice he gave him. We understand alcohol to be a generalized thing, but there are categories. There's something called cider. Cider is practically good for stomach upset because it clears out the stomach lining and some things. So it is very possible that when he mentioned alcohol in that instance, it meant that not a full approval of the fact that he should go and then um, go and drink alcohol. Um, two, my contribution is also to the relation to the Islamic shift over the centuries. Wars was also a contributory factor to that because uh, that's the order of the day. When people take over their land through a war, they enforce their religion and their beliefs. So there was a lot of that between that time till now. That is one of the things that contributed. In fact, most of the Islamic countries was through war that they were able to get some of the people believing in that concept. And then lastly, there's a contribution. This is just a minor thing, but it's in relation to Paul and Saul. You know, I think there has been a generalized accepting that at a point in time, after Saul's conversion, he became Paul. But the truth is that he had dual citizenship. And by research, it says that the Saul was his Jewish name, and then the Paul, which is Paulus in um, Latin, it was his representation of his Roman name. And he over the course of his evangelism, wanted the poor because it made his message easily accepted by the people who were of Roman citizens as compared to the Jewish. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you very much. So let me say that Christians actually went conquering Muslim nations. And at a point, they used minors, minors, children, 12, 13, 14, thinking they would grab the nation's right and they were all killed. And the Muslims got angry and gave them rules. And that was when it went down at a point in time. More of that later. I've wet your appetite. Go and read. Amen. So full. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, as we conclude, the greatest reminder that I believe this lesson brings to all of us is one of evangelism. But first question, and the things that we have all shared, point to the fact that if we continue the way we are going, we will not be far away from what is happening in Europe. Um, how should a church like Methodist Church be around for 180 something years with all our professors. In fact, we have more professors who are pastors than any other church. We have more doctors. 
we have more lawyers. We have both in the clergy and in the lay. When you go to the universities, you find more Methodist professors than you will find in the other religions. In terms of book, we know. So everything to articulate about Christ, we know. Yet, we don't seem to be progressing. What is our mess? The Spirit. Yielding to the Spirit and availing ourselves for the Spirit to use us has become a problem. Even when we are prompted by the Holy Ghost to take action, we'll find a theory to write it off. We'll find every reason why we can't do certain things. Church, remember the last time I said we were doing Easter Sunday and it was a test Sunday, so everybody should invite somebody to church. Uh, only four people invited people to church. I'm very sure you gave reasons for who am I going to find? Uh, whom, who do I even know? So at the end of the day, no effort and nobody was invited. Four people brought people to church. And it, it, it tells us that surely if we are bringing four out of 890 people, then you can tell what will happen in the next 10 years. I believe we need not pay lip service any longer to the issues of evangelism. Let's put ourselves into it. Think evangelism. Dream evangelism and begin to act evangelism. May, let us make it our personal goal. At least if for nothing at all, even if I'm unable to win the person, I will share the gospel with somebody. At least one in the whole year. I'll try to do that. And if we do this, I'm sure there will be many pulse in this church. And there will be much, much, much progress 